Iris van der Fijn. Uh, Iris is an associate professor of liberal arts and sciences at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Recent publications are Generational Feminism, New Materialist's Introduction to a Generative Approach by Lexington Books in 2015, and the subject of Rosie Bridotti, Politics and Concepts, edited with B. Blaghart, uh, Bloomsbury Academic 2014, and of course, New Materialisms, Interviews and Cartographies with Rick Dolfijn, Open Humanities Press 2012. Yes. Okay, thank you, Janneke, for uh, introducing me, and also thank you to the three speakers. Um, I am, um, we're, well, everybody has already said this, we're all from dif different disciplines, so some things, also in my presentation, some things will be familiar and other things won't. Um, but luckily, I will speak most of all as a philosopher, um, as a philosopher of science or a philosopher of the humanities. Um, but I will move in and out of examples constantly, so I will just read my paper from the beginning to the end, trusting there is something in it for each of us. Um, after all, it is all about, I think this whole, this entire seminar is all about a way of presenting ways of thinking, way, presenting methodologies, or rather, how can we enter into certain methodologies? Um, because we all... Uh, as uh, also Niam just made perfectly clear, we are all very much saturated with like these humanist assumptions that we are now trying to move away from. So my contribution, this what is how does it work? Yeah, my contribution discusses diffractive reading um, and asks questions about the spatial temporality about the, uh, of of this methodology. Um, I will be asking the question, where and when does diffraction happen in reading processes? So furthering Donna Haraway's 1992 and 1997 formulations on the need to intimately diffract instead of reflect from a distance, Karen Barad began explicitly practicing the reading through one another of texts and or oeuvres in her 2003 article, post-humanist performativity toward an understanding of how matter comes to matter. Furthermore, Barat has always been very clear about the importance of the distinction between classical and quantum ways of conceptualizing diffraction as a phenomenon out there in, for example, her seminal monograph, Meeting the Universe Halfway. The classical take on diffraction imports the logics of both entities and linear causality. It distinguishes particles and waves and sees waves as resulting from obstruction. Quantum understandings affirm that particles can produce wave patterns and refrain from, uh, the, so quantum understandings refrain from entity logic and linearity while affirming both logics as possible actualizations of a ontologically complex space-time mattering, as she says. So diffractive reading, I think, is part of the post-humanities because of the fact that it traverses the famous two cultures by embarking on a theoretical physics journey in humanities departments and by invi inviting physicists and all other scholars, in fact, um, to consider the research process along the lines of situated knowledges. Situated knowledges have always been transversal, as Donna Haraway, who coined the term, of course, did not affirm the boys from either the natural sciences or the human sciences, but rather did she run with, and this is a quote from her, some of us who tried to stay sane in these dissembled and dissembling times by holding out for a feminist version of objectivity. The latter scholars do not have a sex or gender or a discipline that could count as a full-fledged starting point. They had a demand, a desire, a yearning for something, feminist objectivity. In addition, while reworking humanities categories, such as the social constructs of sex and gender or of the academic disciplines, also the human, that is the alleged container of the mind and the point of origin of thinking, writing, reading, is reworked. Diffractive reading does not shy away from an en engagement with our originary humanicity, which engagement simply wants to affirm everything that went into a or the human, 
I think this is very much what this seminar has been about, or is about. Interestingly, Felicity Coleman's recent work demonstrates that every one of the above-mentioned departures from the humanities as, so as social constructivist, and remember that biological determinism is an approach of social, of a social constructivism too, so um, every one of the above-mentioned departures from the humanities as social constructivist may feed into a theory of feminicity, as she calls it. Just like Haraway affirmed that it is a feminist objectivity we are looking for. Like poems, which are sites of literary production where language too is an actor independent of intentions and authors, bodies as objects of knowledge are material semiotic generative nodes. Their boundaries materialize in social interaction. Boundaries are drawn by mapping practices. Objects do not pre-exist as such. Objects are boundary projects, but boundaries shift from within. Boundaries are very tricky. What boundaries provisionally contain remains generative, productive of meanings and bodies. Citing, citing boundaries is a risky practice. Vicky Kirby argues indeed that the human or anthropomorphism is a boundary project. Importantly, um, to allow anthropomorphism its non-local ubiquity is not to refuse its specificity, but rather to acknowledge that anthropomorphisms, infinite differentiations, specificities, are expressions of one phenomenon, one implicated space-time mattering. How we approach this phenomenon, which includes us, a phenomenon whose identifications entail constant morphogenesis, is to open the question of the human and writing as if for the first time. Oops, sorry. Um, in her book, Quantum Anthrop her book, Quantum Anthropology, so Vicky Kirby's book, Quantum Anthropology, does precisely this. She opens the question. And here in my paper today, I will discuss its methodological implications for the reading post-humanity scholar. What do we do when we sit behind our desks, epistemologically, ontologically, ethically speaking? Janneke Adema here present, Seconds Kirby um, when she explains that the book we are reading or writing is an apparatus by cons uh, consisting of an entanglement of relationships between, among others, authors, books, the outside world, readers, the material production and political economy of book publishing and the discursive formation of scholarship, end of quote. And Felicity Coleman explains why Vicky Kirby's work or diffractive reading per se, is a feminist strategy. The gist is asking questions about boundary work, and while all resulting binaries are gendered or sexed, it doesn't really matter what we say, um, Kirby and diffraction uncover a much more complex starting point, an active point in Coleman's words. Wherever and whenever a feminist strategy has identified, intervened, and offered an analysis of the singularity of the politically gendered body, situating it within its relational, multiplanar, materially constituted world is an example of what I refer to as a feminist active point and is evidence of a change enabler that I call an action of feminicity. So this was, of course, Coleman. The introduction I just gave implies some basic distinctions and that while they seem quite firmly in place in academic work coming from either of the two cultures, the world of scholarship is much more complex. It's relational, multiplanar, materially constituted, says Coleman. So let me offer two unreal distinctions that we try to work with. One, a diffractive reading is not a comparative reading as the idea of a comparison makes use of, full, of a false atomistic logic, text A and text B that we then compare. These epistemological assumptions will have ontological ramifications, albeit that even classificatory approaches show cracks. They never work. Comparative studies assume a bounded human who has made up his or her mind about two different texts and their origin. Two, um, wait a 
a second, is this correct? Yes. Diffractive reading does not make a difference between time and space as most theorizations of temporality spatialize time. This, again, is an epistemological decision with ontological ramifications. Diffractive reading affirms a jumping of scale or of generation occurring behind one's desk. Diffractions happen. While distant reading projects are undertaken and the apps or tools of the digital humanities are or are not calibrated for the recording of algorithmic micromovements, diffractions happen. While close comparative readings are made, um, human scholars, who are always already cyborgs, which we heard from Leslie, find themselves in the situation of or of not embarking on journeys suggested by the cracks, the diffractions. Embarking on them is what I've been doing in my work of diffracting Simondon and Cassira, for instance, and this is work I co conducted together with my colleague Odd Sissel Hull in 2013. Finally, diffractions are indeed sudden remembrings. Oops. Yeah, this is correct. Finally, diffractions are indeed sudden rememberings, pointing to quantum states, including quantum leaps, jumps, superposition, and entanglement, as Barad loosely states in the acknowledgement section of her 2010 paper, Quantum Entanglements and the Hauntological Relations of Inheritance. In this paper, I will argue that just like the quantum physics of the two-slit experiment is ontological and involves nature-culture transversality, situatedness, and feminism, the diffractive readings of the post-humanities even involve the remembrance of unread texts. Also, I will claim that the humanities have always been perfectly capable of acknowledging precisely this quantum entanglement, although they have not theorized it. The post of the post-humanities is hardly linear. This under-theorization or sheer ignorance of quantum entanglement is not at all proof of the defeat of humanists. So let us listen to the first five minutes of the recently broadcasted entanglement episode of Lulu Miller's and Alex Spiegel's Invisibilia podcast from National Public Radio. From NPR News, this is Invisibilia. I'm Elise Spiegel. And I'm Lulu Miller. One day last summer, because we wanted to see something truly magical, Lulu and I found ourselves standing in front of a huge table covered in lasers and mirrors, while a very nervous physicist hovered nearby. I try not to bump anything here. <laughs> the nervous physicist, and our guide for the day, was a grad student from the University of Maryland named David Huckel. It doesn't look like these things do anything, but I promise you all of the pieces on this table are important. <laughs> and David had brought us to the table because he wanted to use the many lasers and mirrors to try to perform something called quantum entanglement. Yeah. He was going to try to take two separate atoms and using his laser, turn them into the same thing. At the simplest level of entanglement, it's just the idea that two things that are separated in space can still be the same thing. That's Jeff Brumfield, the physics guy at NPR, who we brought along to help us try to make sense of what we were about to see. You can have an object that exists in two different spaces and still the same object. I mean, that's wild. That's totally weird, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh... So if you look at that screen right there. So David directed our attention to the first atom, which sat in a metal box on one side of the table. You could actually see it on a screen right above the box. It looked like a little pulsing green dot. So you're looking at it right now. And then he pointed us to the other atom, four feet away across the table in an identical metal box. We typically refer to the, the atoms as east and west because, well, the cardinal directions. <laughs> Two separate physical things in two different places. They pulsed and spun at their own rate. They were completely different individuals, so to speak. But then 
David pressed a button. Yep. One, two, three, go. And lasers shoot out of this contraption on the table. And those lasers hit the atoms and make them spin faster until they each emit a photon, which David and his team can make crash into each other in a way that then connects and entangles the atoms that those photons have left behind them. Now, to know whether it has actually worked, David has rigged up a device that makes an audible click any time entanglement is actually successful. So we wait. And then... So there's entanglement going on right now between these two chambers. <laughs> Those two atoms, east and west, are now one, even though they still sit four feet across from each other on a table. And it's amazing. You can wave your hand in the middle of it. It doesn't affect it. Wow. If David and his colleagues did something to change one of the atoms in its little box, they could be 100% certain that the other atom, still in its little box, would also change. It's almost like destiny. Now the U.S. government is actually funding this work in the hopes of making a computer network, a quantum computer network that could ensure with absolute certainty that information that traveled between two parties was not breached. And so far, scientists have been able to get entanglement to occur at a distance of just over 88 miles. Though theoretically, you could fly one atom to the moon, and still, if you affected it in some way, the other atom back on Earth would be affected instantaneously in the same way. I mean, that's wild. That's totally bizarre. The guys who do these, this research don't understand it. They tell me they don't understand it. It's just there. It's, you know, it's math, and it works. And you don't even need lasers to get it to work. Quantum entanglement, the scientists told us, probably happens all the time in the natural world. Like there could be one particle of you right now entangled with a person that you just passed on the street. The idea that two objects that are physically separated, I mean really physically separated over miles or, you know, eons or whatever, time, space, what have you, are still the same thing is something so foreign, I think it just makes me cautious, I guess, about what I think is possible. What, what, the, what I think I understand about the way the world works, because there's this very common thing at a very small level that doesn't correspond to anything we understand about the universe. Okay, so summing up and leaving distant reading out of the equation for this presentation, comparison must be seen as either a quantum leaping, so a transition from one quantum state to another, but there is no original or copy, or maybe, as in Stephen Greenblatt's multidisciplinary comparisons of the new historicism, a superposition which involves one particle being in one in two quantum states at the same time. Diffractive reading, however, brings the discussion to yet another register, the third register. Is this still working? Yeah. Quantum entanglements, says Karen Barat, are generalized quantum superpositions, more than one, no more than one, impossible to count. They are far more ghostly than the colloquial sense of entanglement suggests. Quantum entanglements are not the intertwining of two or more states, entities, events, but a calling into question of the very nature of two-ness and ultimately of oneness as well. Duality, unity, multiplicity, being are undone. Between will never be the same. One is too few, two is too many. No wonder quantum entanglements defy common sense notions of communication between entities separated by arbitrarily <coughs> large spaces and times. Quantum entanglements require or inspire a new sense of accountability, a new arithmetic, a new calculus of responsibility. Entanglements of there 
of here, there, now, then. Entanglements between one side of the Danube and the other, between La Palma and Tenerife in the Canary Islands, between Elsinore and Copenhagen, between Newton's time and the 21st century, between life and death. So what does this profess? That diffraction involves a radical methodology for the post-humanities. And I don't mean this in this woo kind of way, because I will present, hopefully, a convincing case later on in, in a minute. So Barat argues the following. Meeting the universe halfway, meditation on quantum physics, entanglements of matter and meaning, diffraction as a scenic dock of entangled phenomenon, intraactive metaphysics, difference. Diffraction as methodology, reading texts intraactively through one another, and acting new patterns of engagement, and attending to how exclusions matter. So Barat sees diffraction as a figure of, t of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa. Diffraction stands for an entangled phenomenon, quantum entanglement, interactive metaphysics, and difference. Previously, indeed, I argued diffraction in the entails nature-culture transversality, situatedness, and feminism. So now I will try to make all of this concrete with an example, the work I have done on Suzanne K. Langer. How is her work in and of itself diffractive as in a quantum entanglement? So Suzanne Langer, um, she lived between 1895 and 1985. She dedicated two of her books to scholars making a rather weird combination. Philosophy in a New Key, a study in the symbolism of reason, read and, uh, write and art, is dedicated to Alfred North Whitehead. Between 1924 and 1926, Langer wrote her PhD dis dissertation with Whitehead as her advisor at Radcliffe College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, then the women's college running parallel to Harvard University. Langer calls Whitehead my great teacher and friend on the opening page of her stellar bestseller. Philosophy in the New Key is a really best, was a really bestseller. The book's sequel, Feeling and Form, a theory of art developed from philosophy in a new key, was published in 1953 with the dedication to the happy memory of Ernst Cassirer. Langer, um, she was born in New, in New York City to German immigrants, had started reading Cassirer in the 1920s, but only met him in 1941 after the latter had also migrated to the United States. They stayed closely in touch until Cassirer's death in 1945, a year before Langer's translation of his um, Sprache und Mythos from 1925 came out. When I first heard about Langer through a student, I could not believe a scholar had existed who had worked across such wide variety of philosophers, Whitehead on the one hand and Cassirer on the other hand. Several cartographies exist of scholars influential to Langer's work. In the preface to the third edition of Philosophy in the New Key, Langer argues that her book, although imperfect and representing the embryonic stages of her thought, still proclaims the work of a brilliant, though strangely assorted, intellectual generation. Whitehead, Russell, Wittgenstein, Freud, Cassirer, to name but a few who launched the attack on the formidable problem of symbol and meaning and established the keynote of philosophical thought in our day. Feeling and Form, in turn, the book, uh, which is a, a book I think for this audience quite important because it wants to answer the question, what does art create? It's a very ontological book. This book um, closes cartographically. Here she says, Despite all shortcomings, blind leads, or mistakes that they may see in each other's doctrines, I believe that Bell, Fry, Bergson, Grotje, Bansch, Collingwood, Cassirer, and I, um, not to forget such literary critics as Barfield and Day Lewis and others too, whom I have not named and perhaps not even read, have been and are really engaged on one philosophical project. It was Cassirer, though he never regarded himself an aesthetician, who hooed the keystone of the structure, 
in his broad and disinterested study of symbolic forms. And I, for my part, would put that stone in place to join and sustain what so far we have built. How remarkable that Langer finds herself in the sole company of man. There is somebody who has written a literary bi biography of Langer, um, and he opened this biography with the words that she was one of the first women to pursue an academic career in philosophy in the United States and the first to receive both professional and popular recognition as an American philosopher. Um, however, as the research of Arabella Lyon shows, scholarship often subsumes Langer under the heading of the male scholars that she herself lists, whereas her own ideas qualitatively shift the work of her teachers and colleagues. Lyon also mentions Langer's own denial of any impact of the fact that she was a woman, contrary to proof such as Langer's lowly ranked post-PhD position at Harvard, the fact that tenure came only at the very end of her career, and the necessity of Whitehead putting in a good word for Langer so that she could get her early work pu published in the journal Mind. Apart from gender, and this is my, my, part, my, my real point, also remarkable is Langer's phrasing, the brilliant, though strangely assorted, intellectual generation of the first cartography is really engaged on one philosophical project, according to the second. The appearance of the French philosopher Henri Bergson at the heart of an affirmation of a philosophical project, which is really one, comes as a surprise by the time the reader of Feeling and Form has reached the monograph's conclusion. Um, the table of contents even announces a lengthy discussion of Bergson's work as Bergson's failing. Whereas Langer typifies Bergson as the artist's favorite philosopher whose dream of duration brings his metaphysics to the very brink of a philosophy of art, he is also said to suffer from a lock, lack of logical daring. So she says he is not logical, by the way, um, basically. Although Whitehead has disappeared from the second cartography, but not at all from feeling and form as a whole, the praise for both him and Cassira stands in sharp contrast to Langer's treatment of Bergson, the illogical philosopher, the, the philosopher that artists love. She seems to have one clear negative opinion about Bergson, although she opens feeling and form with a statement about polemics and their distortive role in philosophizing that I deem Bergsonian. Langer writes, were I to follow out every refutation of other doctri doctrines which my line of argument implies, that line would be lost in a tangle of controversy. Consequently, I have avoided polemics as much as possible, though, of course, not altogether. This affirmative stance goes against the grain of scholarly habit, which inclination makes that the scholar is in real danger of losing one's way in the pigeon, pigeonholes of purely academic description. So this is Bergson's take on polemics. Divergences are striking between the schools, that is to say, in short, between the groups of disciples formed around certain of the great masters. But would one find them as clear-cut between the masters themselves? Something here dominates the diversity of systems, something, I repeat, simple and definite, like a sounding of which one feels that it has more or less reached the bottom of the same ocean, even though it brings each time to the surface very different materials. It is on these materials that disciples normally work, in that is the role of analysis. And the master, insofar as he formulates, develops, translates into abstract ideas what he brings, is already, as it were, his own disciple. But the simple act, which has set analysis in motion and which hides behind analysis, emanates from a faculty quite different from that of analyzing. This is, by very definition, intuition. So apart from the fact that this quote is also analogous to Langer's take on scholars' obsession with class classifying artistic styles or traditions and on their consequence, 
consequential failure to notice the problem of artistic creation per se, because that is what she wants to, to reach, one may ask how Bergson's take on polemics, or let's say on the entanglement of epistemology and ontology, forms the core of my interpretation of an approach to Langer's philosophy of art. The fact that this is contrary to Langer's own words, I have circumvented in a, in a threefold manner in research that I have done on Langer. First, on a descriptive level, I have verified that even Langer herself ultimately reworks the assertion Bergson's failing. Second, it is sound to draw Bergson back, back in, in spite of claims to the contrary, because it is in the nature of the cartographical method to affirm that one's own relations to and the objective relations between philosophers are fundamentally open. Langer endorses this openness by even inclu including the work of, and that's, here it is in red, those whom I have not named and perhaps not even read to her bibliography. Elsewhere, she refers to um, wait a second. Elsewhere, she refers to the literature behind us, known or unknown to any particular thinker. In Philosophy in a New Key, Langer says, quotations could be multiplied almost indefinitely. This is strange indeed. But this strangeness Oh, this is the literature behind us, known or unknown to any particular thinker. I mean, this is even what she includes to her own thought. So it's strange indeed, just like the, uh, the physicist said during it in the podcast. But strangeness is in the nature of quantum entanglement. And this type of diffraction characterizes, in my reading, Langer's philosophy and is part of the post-humanities. That's my talk.